Ouija board, Ouija board, with the letters and the runes. Tell me, what are the initials for Tent Talks Tunes? The Ouija board is kind of erratic and kind of wobbly. I think it's trying to say that the initials are T, T, T. It's got to be it, right? It ain't S-T-U. Ouija board can be, can be more specific. I guess it's going to be a T. Well, Ouija board, thank you for your assistance in introducing this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. The human being got it done pretty quickly. I could have just told you the episodes for Tent, the uh, initials for Tent Talks Tunes are TTT. <sighs> Never rely on technology to do what a human being can do. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying. Let me reach on over here to the big old monitor and make sure that the technology is doing what the human being can't do, which is stream live all over the globe. To all of you, my frantic fans, my loyal listeners, my vivacious, vibratory viewers. Oh, look at that. I look at the monitor and I can see me, which means you can probably see me. I see Sean Mosher is tuned in. Hello, Sean. Good to have you on board, as always. Mr. Alan Versapellis, the maker of harsh acoustic sounds himself. Hello, Alan. And anybody else who might be on board, whether it be the Ouija board or the TTT board or the rapidly listing ship that all of humanity is on board of. <laughs> but that ship's been listing pretty much since the advent of humanity. So nothing to worry about. It's just the same old, same old as far as that goes. As Devo says in the beginning was the end. When the human being first crawled out of that primordial slime, that was it. It was all over. Kurt Wargo is tuned in. WXCI Alum Kurt from Danbury is in. Hello, Kurt. Good to see you, man. Yeah, I got uh, some stuff to talk about this week. As I lubricate the larynx with this good, good jug of Danbury tap. Mm-mm-mm. Heavy Metal Fortified. Yeah, as is so often the case, I woke up this morning and um, said to myself, Self, what day is it? Any oh, yeah, it's Wednesday. Okay, Wednesday. What, is, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, right. It means I got to do 10 Talks Tunes tonight. Boy, what am I going to talk about? Hmm. Sometimes the inspiration hits me instantaneously. Sometimes it doesn't. And today was a day when the inspiration did not hit me instantaneously. I had no idea what I was going to talk about tonight. So I <laughs> I did indeed see the box for the Ouija board. And that was step one in crafting tonight's episode of Tent Talks Tunes. You know, a lot of good television is made using props. And you got to admit, as uh, funky and finicky as the Ouija board was earlier tonight, it makes a darn good prop. So, you know, I was bumming around, looking at the Ouija board, getting nowhere with it at all. And I shuffled into my kitchen, you know, because when you wake up, you got to start the day and, you know, get things going. First point of order generally is feeding Harry the cat, who at this moment is curled up sound asleep on the sofa, as he quite often is. And so, you know, I'm getting the cat food out and um, looking around my kitchen in a daze because it's still early in the day and my eyes aren't open yet and the brain's not firing on all cylinders yet. And I looked out the window and I saw it fixed next to the window sill was one of my many items of decoration that I have in my uh, kitchen. And it was a cassette tape. Yes, a cassette tape with a piece of art that I've always really loved. And actually, I'll show it to you right here. I don't have the cassette, but I have the LP. If anybody recognizes this, then you get super bonus points for knowing your stuff. 
Murray Gelman, do you know this one? Mike Lesser, do you know this one? I have the cassette of this. Stick, uh, stuck. I was going to say sticking. I guess it is sticking. I have the cassette tape of this stuck to my wall in my kitchen because a cassette is small and it's easy to display. And I play this record so often that I don't want to stick it on the wall, man. I got to have one accessible to me at all times. So I saw this and this provided the inspiration for tonight's episode of Tense Talks Tunes. And in case you don't know what it is, you're going to find out soon enough. But first, we have to survey the scene around us. We got to check the bulletin board, check the mailbox, check all the boxes. And then we're going to talk some tunes. Let's see here. Uh, Pear from Sweden is tuned in. Hello, Pear. He says that not only has he the pleasure of watching tonight, but he also got the orange vinyl version of the People's Choice album in the mail today. Yay! Well, since Pear broached the subject, I might as well uh, take one step over to my right and grab a prop. We know Tent Talks Tunes turns on props. Hold on one second, guys. I always have these very close at hand because you never know when someone from Sweden is going to broach this subject. And it's a good thing he did because uh, a plum done forgot to talk about this one, especially considering that um, you might have noticed that the bulletin board is full of stuff. It's been kind of empty the past couple of weeks, but I've found a few things to adhere to it and to show you. And one of them is, of course, the hype and the shill for my Discogs and eBay store. The Discogs store has been down for quite a while, but now it's back up. I was able to untangle the tech difficulties that was not allowing me to sell on Discogs for a few weeks. The store is back up. And as Pear from Sweden just said, he got his orange vinyl copy of Anti-Scene People's Choice in the mail. You can now get it from me, Malcolm Tent, on Discogs and or eBay. That's if you haven't already purchased it from Jeff Clayton himself on the Anti-Scene Big Cartel store, you can get it from me. We pressed these beauties up for the Anti-Scene 40th anniversary show. Sold quite a few of them at the show. And as promised, brought the remainders home to let you the frantic public have a crack at them. So we pressed 135 on orange. You can see that's the orange. And we pressed 300 on blue. Every single first Schluggerner one of these was hand stamped and hand stickered by myself with a rubber stamp and a roll of stickers. Contained on the beautiful opaque vinyl is a selection of songs requested specifically by anti-scene fans who answered a poll posted on our Facebook page. They said, how come you guys never play this song and that song and this song and that song? We said, vote on the one song you want us to play or however many you want. Vote on the songs that you want us to play and we'll play them. And not only that, we'll record the session professionally on a 16-track recorder and professionally mix it and release it as an album. So we got the poll results. We tabulated them. We put together the set. And the result is this album, People's Choice, which was for sale only at the Anti-Scene 40th Anniversary Show and now is available not only from the Anti-Scene Big Cartel store, but from yours truly, me. So thank you, Pear, for reminding me to tell all the people about this record, man. I love this record. I was playing it just yesterday while I was packing and shipping stuff. I'm usually not the kind of guy to sit around listening to my own records, but... Gotta remember that when it comes to Anti-Scene, I'm not just a bass player. I'm also a huge mark. So I love to get down and shake a tail feather and boogie woogie to the southern fried soul rock and roll stylings of anti-scene, baby. And you can, too. So what's going on, man? Well, I've already hepped you to the fact that my Discogs and eBay stores are up. For those of you out there who need 
want and have got to have the personal touch, well, come on down to Maplewood, New Jersey. This Sunday the 12th, I will be selling at the Maplewood, New Jersey Record Fair on Sunday. I have a giant table full of super duper high quality vinyl. As they say these days, carefully curated by myself. I don't put anything out there on the table unless I personally stand behind it. I check the conditions, I clean them, I price them, I research them, I bag them, I label them accordingly. And every single record on that table is a record that I think in one way or another is okay. Even if it's by a, an artist who I don't particularly care to listen to. Oh. Here he is. The culprit himself, Harry the Cat. Harry, are you going to say hi to the people? He will if I face this way. No. Harry's got a brand new position to assume. Let's see if he's going to assume it. Looks like he is. Harry has got, um, I think he's got some parrot in his genetic makeup because he is definitely taken towards perching on my shoulder and purring in my ear. So I think we're going to have Harry on the shoulder for a little while here. We had kind of a health scare with Harry last week. I didn't know uh, what was going on with the little guy. He was having some problems, but um, he seems to be much better now and back to normal. So if you guys don't mind staring at a cat's rump for the time he chooses to join us, there it is. Harry the Cat's butt live on Facebook and archived forever on my YouTube channel. Yes, indeed he do. That is the guy. Well, there's some of that face. Here's some of that award-winning, good-looking face. Yeah. And let's let's see if he knocks down the backdrop. You think he's going to do it? You think Harry's going to topple the backdrop? He's already revealed <laughs> some of the strange workings of TPOS, and he's knocked my glasses out of shape. Oh, boy, we are really just going nuts here, guys. Let's get this camera angle back. This, this is what live TV is all about. This is what makes it what it is. You just never know what's going to happen. Mm, there he is. <laughs> the one fanged wonder. The one-eared wonder. Hi, guys. Anyway. I don't put it on the table unless I stand behind it. So, yeah, come on down to Maplewood, New Jersey this Sunday, the 12th. I will be standing behind a table full of classy vinyl. And you can walk home with it because the price is right. Little bit less. Actually, exactly one week. One week. One month from today, kids. December 8th, 2023 at the Milestone in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is the Milestone's 54th anniversary. 54 years. That venue has been in operation continuously. And Jeff Clayton, when he was doing his show, Break On Through yesterday, and Break On Through airs every Tuesday at 8 p.m. on the Anti-Scene Facebook page, he was musing over the probable fact that the Milestone is the longest-running underground independent venue, certainly on the East Coast, Maybe in the entire country? What do you guys think? I mean, 54 years of the milestone, and, and Jeff was trying to name some of the venues that... Like, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about true, genuine, underground, independent venues that have been in operation as long as the milestone. And I was kind of thinking myself, I mean, maybe the empty bottle in Chicago? Maybe? Um... Geno's in Portland, Maine, I know, has had a really good long run, and so has John and Peter's in New Hope, Pennsylvania. Those are the only two I can think of that might have been around even as long as the milestones. So if any of you guys have any uh, ideas about that, I'd be very curious to hear them, you know? And that's the thing about venues like the Milestone and John and Peter's and Geno's. They fly completely under the radar, they don't get the big write-ups in Rolling Stone. They don't have high-paid publicity departments 
you know, trumpeting their names to the masses. They just keep on doing what they do, hosting bands and rocking and rolling, usually against great odds. So big salute to the Milestone for hanging in there for 54 years. And uh, hey, pat on the back for Anti-Scene for hanging in there for over 40 at this point. Kind of appropriate that a 40-year continuous running band should play the headlining slot on the first night of a 54-year continuously running venue. So yes, night number one, the eighth, is Anti-Scene, Southside Punks, and the Hellfire Choir. And then the next night, we got a bunch of other cool bands such as Bogloaf and No Anger Control and a few others. And I do believe I'm going to be there the next night, too. I'm pretty sure I'm going to attend both nights. Obviously, the first night because I'm playing. But the second night, I think I'm going to check out the bands at the Milestone. So come on down, rock and roll all night and party every day. And if you survive the experience, go to church on Sunday and say, thank you, Lord, for allowing me to do that, because that was an awful lot of fun. Amen. Hoist a jug of Danbury tap to that, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> ah. What else is on the bulletin board? Well, you see that there poster? It is official. It is 100% official. Yesterday was the live launch date for Tiny Tim, Prisoner of Love. Recorded in the early 1990s in Tampa, Florida with a small orchestra which was professionally scored and arranged and played by some top-shelf musicians at the University of South Florida. This is Tiny Tim crooning his heart out in a tribute to his favorite artist of all time, a guy named Russ Colombo. And man, this is good. I really consider this to be a feather in the TPOS cap. This is... <clears throat> Tiny said it was his best album. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm gonna disagree, man. It's really good. I just know that I'm very, very happy to be working in conjunction with Punk Media, the original label who released this and produced it and made the whole thing happen. Very happy to be uh, working in conjunction with them to get this out on vinyl for the first time ever. It's in a variety of colors, one of them being Cheap Suit Gray. And if you look very carefully, you can see it's a mix of like pink and gray. And just by pure dumb luck, it kind of mirrors the color scheme of the cover. Yes. So we got Cheap Suit Gray. And then if that ain't enough, we have a delightful shade of... Tulip Red. Now there's 266 of these on red, 266 on red. There's 304 on cheap suit gray. And for all you wild, got to have all the variants, nutty record collectors, kind of like me, I'm one of them. I admit it freely. For one of those types of people, you can have one of exactly 41, 41 on hit record gold vinyl. Only 41 made, and each one comes with a hand stamp certificate of genuine, you better believe it's realness, put together by me, Malcolm Tent. So there you have it. Tiny Tim Prisoner of Love, a tribute to Russ Colombo, is officially out. Get it from me direct. Go onto my Discogs or on the eBay and ye shall receive. All right. So let's see, we've had a visit from Harry the Cat. He was peacefully slumbering on my lap. We've checked the bulletin board. The mailbox was empty this week, no worries. Now we're gonna get, to down, gonna get down to the vegan lunch meat of the matter in which I, Tent, talk tunes. Now, James Pogo, who is a very educated music consumer, 
took a guess on the identity of the album that I flashed earlier. And he said, this here, Laurels? Incorrect, sir. This is not the Laurels. I'm not going to tell you who it is just yet. I, I will say, though, that seeing the cassette of this album stuck to the wall next to my window in the kitchen triggered me into thinking and ruminating and meditating about one of my favorite bands of all time, kids. I'm not joking. A band who I love, absolutely love, and have loved ever since I discovered them in 1977-ish. But I've never really, really, really done a deep dive into them. I've talked about them a few times on Tent Talks Tunes, but I've never really uh, pinched my nose and dived completely headfirst into the world of not one, not two, not three, not four, not five, neither six, seven, nor eight, and certainly not nine. I've never dived into the world of 10 CC. 10 CC. How seriously do I take 10 CC? Well, I take them so seriously that I've got this many albums by them. And I've got this many albums that are peripherally related to them. And I've got this many singles by them. Yes, I love 10cc. Even if on this radio DJ promo copy of I'm Not In Love, and I think everybody in the world knows, I'm not in love, so don't forget it. I mean, come on, they still play it on the radio to this day. It's not te technically not a white label, it's kind of like a, I don't know what you would call it, a 30% tint label. I'm not in love, but uh, the B-side Channel Swimmer, no. No, 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 no. Some radio DJ was instructed to not play Channel Swimmer. Do not play Channel Swimmer. No, 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 no. No. Don't play Channel Swimmer. Too bad, because it's a great song. 10CC were always very friendly to the people who bought their records, their singles, um almost always had non-album B-sides on them. And they were quite prolific. So there's a whole wealth of non-album tracks by 10CC that can be had if you get their singles. And one reason why I'm able to have this many records by 10CC is that 10CC is a very easy band to collect because nobody really wants their records. Nobody really cares about 10CC that much. Which on the one hand is a real shame, on the other hand is really cool because if they had the kind of market saturation of, say, Yes, or Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, or even King Crimson, for that matter, I really doubt that I would care about them that much, you know? I don't think so. I mean, as it is, I discovered 10CC because of the single they had in 1977, Things We Do For Love, Things We Do For Love. Like walking in the rain and the snow when there's nowhere to go and you're feeling like a part of you is dying. Another awesome hit single from 10CC. That song was on the radio all over the place in Miami when I was a kid on Y100. Y100 was top 40 radio at its best in the 1970s. And so Things We Do For Love big massive hit and of course I remembered I'm not in love from a couple years prior so I already kind of knew that 10cc had at least one or two songs that I really liked but you know that was about it they weren't really that much of a a blip on my radar that all changed probably within a year of the things we do for love being a great big hit when on one of our regular Sunday trips to the Westland Mall in Hialeah, Florida, we did what we always did. The whole family would walk into the front entrance. We'd stop in front of J.C. Penney 
and say, okay, everybody, meet back here in front of J.C. Penny in an hour, and we would all scatter. Everybody in the family would go to where they wanted to go. And, um, you know, to this day, to this very, I have to ask my mom about that. To this very day, I don't know where my parents went during that hour at the Westland Mall. I have no idea where they went or what they did. I know that me and my brothers, we each had our each we each had our individual circuits, but certain favorites of ours were the Barefoot Mailman, which is like a South Florida version of Spencer Gifts, and of course the Orange Bowl, which is a South Florida version of the Orange Julius, and of course all the department stores. And um, my middle brother loved Walden Books. My little brother loved whatever toy store there was, and we would all usually end up meeting each other somewhere along the line at one or two of these places. And we almost all ended up at Specs Music, which was my, I made a beeline to go into Specs Music. That was the main stop every trip to the mall to see what was new, to just browse the bins, and of course to dig into the cutout bins. And I've talked a lot about the cutout bins on Tent Talks Tunes. The cutout bins being where all the unsold hits of yesteryear or the total misses of yesteryear would end up. The overstocks, the deletions, basically the cast off remnants that nobody wanted anymore. I was fascinated by that stuff. I love the fact that your cutout bin records cost anywhere from 49 cents to like two, $2.99 at the max at that time. $2.99 was the most expensive cutout record there was. And this was when full retail on a record was like $6.49, $6.99. So the idea of getting a full-length album for that cheap fascinated me. And it also fascinated me that they were like stuck off in a bin somewhere, usually not in any order whatsoever, that it looked like nobody ever browsed through. You know, I, I got a real sense of uh, outsider status with these cutouts. How's that for a metaphysical relationship to a cheap record? Pretty cool, huh? So I'd always go through the cutout bins. And um, sometimes when there was a, a hot new deletion that just came into specs, they'd actually put it in the front. They'd make a big pyramid-shaped display in the front that would have certain deletions that had just arrived. And sure enough, one day I walked into Specs, and loud and proud, first thing you saw as you walked in was a big old display featuring that band, 10CC, the album Deceptive Bends, that had the song The Things We Do For Love, and it was $2.99. I said, whoa, that's pretty cool. I know that album. I like that song. And it's only $2.99? And I... I don't think I'd ever seen the album cover before, but the album cover right off the bat was kind of weird. The front was back. Uh, the what? The front was weird. <laughs> the back was weird. And the back was, if anything, even weirder. It had this kind of, uh, I don't know, vaguely sinister air to it with the, the weird, mysterious figure in the back whose face you couldn't see taking off the diving bell. It was, it was kind of odd. And then I looked at some of the song titles. Good Morning Judge, Marriage Bureau Rendezvous, Honeymoon with Bee Troop, I Bought a Flat Guitar Tutor, You've Got a Cold, You've Got a Cold? What kind of a song is that? You've Got a Cold? Mm, Modern Man Blues? Hmm. Like everything, all these song titles were... were kind of off kilter, you know, this was not normal song titling here. This was kind of weird. And coupled with the weirdness of the front cover and especially the back cover, and the fact that I loved that one song and it was only $2.99, of course I bought it. Not sight unseen, but certainly sound unheard, except for the one hit single from like the previous year. Took it home, cracked it open, you know, the, the inner sleeve wasn't that interesting, whatever. But uh, the graphics on the 
lyric sleeve were pretty cool and the lyrics were definitely bizarre and funny and weird and eccentric and off kilter and i dropped the needle in the groove on side one and i was hooked it didn't take very long just about half the way through the first song on side one good morning judge i was a fan i was a fan of the entire album except for a ballad or two to this day completely rocks my boat. I love this album. And that began my long, my lifelong love affair with 10CC. And uh, I mean, dude, the songwriting, the production, never mind the lyrics. 10CC reminded me a lot in a lot of, in a, they reminded me a lot in a lot of ways of Sparks. <clears throat> Musically, fantastic, top shelf, but a little bit abnormal, a little bit weird. The lyrics were definitely kind of weird and kind of abnormal. The sense of humor was very eccentric and odd. This is the kind of stuff that your average Joe and Mabel in middle America weren't going to get. You know, and I realized fairly quickly that 10CC were very subversive because this album had the one perfect hit single, which was The Things We Do For Love. And basically the rest of it was weird, you know, with very funny lyrics. So I was definitely taken by that. So from that moment on, my eye was open for more 10CC records. And luckily, 10CC had this kind of a pattern in the U.S., it was like every other record was a hit. And then every other record, like the records that came between the hit records, bombed. Like the first album, the eponymous one, was not a giant hit in the U.S., but it did have the song Rubber Bullets on it, which was kind of a hit. The album after that, tanked. The third album had I'm Not In Love, massive hit. The fourth album, which was the second 10cc record I ever got, How Dare You, tanked. Not a hit. And it went pretty much straight to the cutout bins because the record companies and in their incredibly finite wisdom said, well, you know, we had a great big hit with... Uh, I'm not in love, so therefore we're going to press a million of these right off the bat. We're going to sell a million. And, well, there just weren't any hit singles on this record. So the record company was left with, you know, probably about 800,000 unhold unsold records, which they cut the corners off of and drilled holes in and dumped them at deeply discounted prices, which meant they ended up in the cutout bin, which meant I was looking for them. Oh, yeah. So that was the second one I found, How Dare You, by 10CC. Probably pound for pound their weirdest album. And also maybe their most musically proficient, maybe the one that's the best produced. I would say this one is peak 10CC. This is the one that either you're going to get or you ain't. But I find it to be chock full of catchy, incredible slightly weird, eccentric, should have been hit singles with really cool off-kilter lyrics. I mean, what are some of the song titles that hooked me? I mean, once again, besides the strangeness of the uh, the cover, you can't really tell what's going on. There's some kind of thematic continuity here, but what is it exactly? Everybody's on a phone. The same characters recur from the front to the back. They're all on the inside on the phone. This was quite bewildering to a 13, 14 year old. But the song titles, man, How Dare You, I Want to Rule the World, Art for Art's Sake, Don't Hang Up, your boy was hooked. And he was able to sink his teeth into an album that was every bit as good as, if not better, than Deceptive Ben's. All right, and this is it. I'm on to this band now, and I'm going to tell you guys right now, during those years, 
those years between seventh and most of 11th grade, I was not a popular dude. I was not on the inside of any social circle in junior high or most of high school at all. I was a damn weirdo. I mean, I still am. But back then, it, meant, it made a lot more difference if you were or you weren't. I was not on the side of the normies. I did not... Here comes the strong language, guys. Forgive me. I did not give a fuck about the latest baseball game. I couldn't give a good goddamn about who won the football game on Monday night. I did not give a shiz about anything that these people liked. By the same token, they didn't want to know anything about the kind of stuff I liked, which, you know, later became punk rock and, of course, art and reading and, you know, hanging out at the library. We were poles apart. When you're in school, that's huge. Okay, so I was perpetually on the outside of that. And the fact that I was able to find this really great music in a spot of the record store that nobody went to, that definitely connected with me on a, a deep level. I was like, you know what, this is this is my band. This is this is music for me. None of these jerk offs know who 10cc is. You know, if, if if they even remember that song from last year, I know that none of them, none of them have this album. None of them have this album let alone a Filipino pressing of it, like this one, Filipino. Nope, those jerk-offs know nothing about this, and they're never going to know about it, and I like it that way. I like it a lot. So I had what was probably the first band that I could call all my own. This is before I discovered Devo. I had 10cc. Nobody else liked 10cc. And so now the hunt was really on. We were really, 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 we <laughs> were really on a mad tear to find as much by 10cc as we possibly could. And uh, let's see here. Jeff Clayton says, in regards to how dare you, they were ahead of their time predicting everybody in the room would be on a phone. Right? Just no chords. No chords. And by the way, I want to take a, a slight swerve here since Jeff Clayton's tuned in, I was going to uh, make a plug for an album that he released on his label, Long Haired Weirdo Records, that I really like by a really important North Carolina band called The Streets Living Theater. And Jeff Clayton has recently reissued their album on his own label on CD, limited edition of 100. And I was tearing the place apart earlier trying to find my copy of the disc so I could show it to you I don't know where it is. It's in a box. And the box is somewhere. Somewhere. And that's why I didn't show it to you earlier today. But I've listened to that record quite a few times. And I really like it. It's really cool. And I use this term loosely. Doors inspired. Doors inspired, but not doors slavish original rock music from the 70s. And I love that kind of stuff. I love the unheard, unknown bands who are actually doing something original and on their own. And Streets Living Theater were a great example of that. Very influential to anti-scene, and I think music that should be heard. So, as we all know, I don't plug anything unless I believe in it, unless I like it personally. I'm inviting you to check out Streets Living Theater. Get it. If you don't want to get it, listen to it. I'm sure it's out there somewhere. Scott Savage, Memento More, a very influential man with some very good music. So Streets Living Theater. Mm. All right. Now, did my computer freeze up while I was giving that little uh, pep talk about Streets Living Theater? Let's see if I can refresh myself. Hope you guys will forgive the close-up of my forehead while I do this. <clears throat> okay, I'm on, baby. I'm on. Now, James Pogo says he's never heard 10CC, but let me tell you, James Pogo, you need to hear 10CC. You need to hear Streets Living Theater. You need to hear 10CC. The hunt was on for more 10CC. 
And this is where it gets really fun because their stuff, as I said before, was really obscure, a lot of them. And so even their first album, which did kind of have sort of a hit single, but not really, the first album was dang near impossible to find. So the only reason I, the only way I could find this was by perusing a mail order catalog. There was a mail order company called Square Deal Records. And four times a year in the mail, I get this big, thick print catalog printed on telephone book style paper, like really thin paper. And it was just page after page after page of weird imports, cutouts, the odd bootleg that would slip its way in there. They also sold buttons and, you know, just really cool stuff. They were from San Luis Obispo, California, and they're still in business to this day. God bless them. Um, so I'd look forward to that catalog every quarter, and I would tear through that thing from front to back. And the cutout section, once again, was of great importance to me and great interest because they put new stuff in there all the time. And sure enough, <clears throat> they had listed in the catalog one time the self-titled 10cc record. And this record was not in any of the stores. You know, I, I'd never even seen a copy of this, and I haunted the record stores. Never saw it, ever. But there it was in the Square, the square Deal mail order catalog. So I sent away my two ninety nine, you know, along with some other mo some other dough for some other cutout records, and waited. And waited. And waited. People out there, and this is just a case where if the shoe fits, wear it. I'm not accusing anybody of anything, but anybody out there, people out there who are very impatient these days when their mail-ordered item takes longer than four or five days to get there, y'all don't remember what it was like when please allow six to eight weeks for delivery was de rigueur when that was the norm. When you would fill out the order form with a pen, item by item, line by line, either go down to the 7-Eleven and get a money order, or ask your mom and dad to write a check, or at your own risk, send cash. We, even back then we knew that was a bad idea. Check or money order, <clears throat> or COD, make arrangements for that. Fill it out, put it in an envelope, Write out the address of the place, return address, put a stamp on it, drop it in the mailbox, and then wait. Six to eight weeks. Wait. And wait. And of course, I'm the kind of guy, after three days, I was in my bedroom window scanning the street looking for the UPS truck to show up. You know, let alone six to eight weeks. Oh, man. Oh, Lord have mercy. And if I saw the UPS truck, I'd be like, eh, 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 and it would drive by, and I'd be like, mm. deep, dark depression. Excessive misery. Nothing from Square Deal. Boo. And then somewhere, sometime within that six to eight week window, the UPS truck would pull around the corner and it would drive up to the front of the house and it would park in front of my house. And I would be in my bedroom window, peering out the window, watching, waiting, watching, waiting. I wasn't desperate enough to actually run out and go meet the driver, but I was watching. If the driver got out with that 12 by 12 square box, I knew that I was in clover because I knew that my records that I had mail ordered from California IA were here finally, finally. And so I'd keep my cool until the driver knocked on the front door. And then I would go run to the front door, casually open it and say, hello. And back in those days, you had to sign for the package. So I would sign for the package. Very cool. Very calm. 
very collected. Return the clipboard to the driver. Receive the box and say thank you. Close the door. And then run straight to the kitchen table and open up that box as fast as I could. Oh my God. And one day, there it was, the first 10cc record. $2.99. Could not find it in any of the record stores in South Florida, but there it was. <clears throat> and I thought the cover was kind of nondescript. I mean, now I, I sort of get it more. But at the time, I thought it was nondescript. Didn't think the back was too interesting either. But, once again, it was the song titles. Johnny Don't Do It. Headline Hustler. Speed Kills. Rubber Bullets. The Hospital Song. Ships Don't Disappear in the Night, Do They? Fresh Air for My Mama. I mean... Weird stuff. Sand in my face. Weird stuff. And I think you've already guessed the rest of the story. I dropped the needle in the groove and it was great. Top shelf production, top shelf songwriting, eccentric, strange lyrics, hooked, lined, and sinkered. And so, you know, of course, I use the same hit or miss, hunt and peck method for finding 10cc records. It involved cutout bins. It involved mail order. The one and only record I actually bought by 10cc when it first came out, and it was on the bins, or in the shelves, on the shelves, in the bins, was this one right here, 10cc, Live and Let Live. Now, I've always been a sucker for live albums. I have done at least one episode of Tent Talks Tunes about the phenomenon of the live album. So, okay, here's a 10cc double live album. Right off the bat, I'm in love. Maybe they said they were not in love, but I was. You know, good pun, live and let live. Once again, kind of like a mildly disturbing photo. The colors are off. The focus is off. It's all these guys hopping out the back of a truck in this kind of weird industrial setting. Once again, this is not your normal looking rock music album. It just looked very odd. And of course it had, you know, all the 10 CC hits and it was a double live album. And you know, my, my thinking at the time was that the live album was better because of the most exciting recordings of the song. You know, it's like if the studio album had a song that was okay, the live version was going to be like, Ugh, you know, with the loud volume and the distortion and the screaming crowd and the mayhem and extended versions and, you know, jams and all that. You know, because my first album, as we talked about, was Grand Funk Live Album. And that spoiled me for the rest of my life. You know, that, that's how I expected that every live album should be. Just pure excitement and complete overdrive for the whole damn album. Imagine my shock and disappointment when the Jethro Tull live album was nothing like that. Imagine my horror and dismay when I flushed some money down the toilet to get the Kansas live album. And it was nothing like that. Boy, howdy. <clears throat> And so, yeah, I'll admit to being mildly bummed when the 10cc album was nothing like that. Nothing like that. Now, you see, the big difference between this 10cc and this 10cc is that this 10cc consisted of four guys. Graham Goldman, Eric Stewart, Lol Cream, and Kevin Godley. This 10cc, well, you can see there's six of them. You had Graham Goldman and Eric Stewart, and then four other guys. And you can always, I think it's a pretty fair truism to say that if you need four guys to replace two guys, you're in trouble. And truer words were never spoken about 10cc. The basic delineation of responsibility was... If you want to put it in its simplest terms, Godly and Cream were the avant-garde weirdos. Gouldman and Stewart were the pop-making hit machines. 
and somehow those two factions were able to somehow mesh and create this really bizarre, wonderful confection of pop perfect weirdness like Sheet Music, their second album, which had other incredible song titles. The Wall Street Shuffle, The Worst Band in the World, Old Wild Men, Clockwork Creep, Silly Love. I mean, dude. That's what the original four-man lineup of 10CC created. The post-breakup, when it was just Eric Stewart and Graham Goldman, I'm going to say it right off the bat. <clears throat> too slick, too creamy, too dreamy, too clean, too professional, too damn polite. And this album's nothing but Eric Stewart and Graham Goldman songs. And man, after the, it starts off with a rousing version of the second sitting for the last supper, another great song title. Second sitting for the last supper kicks it off with a bang. And from there, the energy level just kind of goes over the course of a double album. I think I paid $7.99 for this when it came out, and I was very disappointed. And that's kind of the problem with 10CC. When they lost steam, they lost it fast. I mean, it was pretty much overnight. You know, Deceptive Benz didn't have Godly and Cream on it, but I think at that time, Goulman and Stewart had something to prove. So they really pulled out all the stops, and they made an album that was as good as anything that the original lineup did. But after that, Man, those guys just had no sense of the avant-garde. And it was really unfair because every album they made afterwards, you could tell was they were trying. You know, the covers were great. You know, their, their first album as Gouldman and Stewart plus whomever. Album called Bloody Tourists. Cool cover. I don't know. Nothing wrong with the cover. Song titles, Dreadlock Holiday. I didn't know what a dreadlock was, but it was a weird song title. The Anonymous Alcoholic, Red's in My Bed. Um, Everything You've Wanted to Know About Exclamation Marks. That was a song title that hooked me. But Living That Live was so weak that I did not buy this when it came out. Didn't do it. Because Living That Live really disappointed me. And... Um, and I finally picked it up many years later as a cutout. And I played it and I listened to it. And as you can see by the notes that I wrote on the bag, because I'd always keep notes when I was doing radio, tracks A4, tracks A4 and A5 are decent. The rest of them, can you read my handwriting? Yes. Two decent songs, and the rest of them are half dead. Sorry, guys. That's the way it rolls. And then, you know, they, they just kept cranking out albums, man. The next one was 10cc Look Here. By this time, it seemed to me like they were trying too hard. You know, it just seemed like between the title and... The graphics, you know, the group, Are You Normal? Well, they had already answered the question. Yes, they were very normal. They were completely normal, and they're masquerading as weirdos. I don't even know what song titles are. I didn't even care at this point. I didn't even buy this one. I found this one for like a buck somewhere. Let's take a look at my uh, notes on this one for radio play. Can you guys read this? A2 and A4 are almost good. And B5 is not moribund. So almost good and not moribund are the highest praise I can give to three of the songs on this album. Ain't looking too good, guys. And so, yeah, 10CC just kept cranking them out. Or, you know, Godley and Stewart did. But what about, um, I'm sorry, uh, Goldman and Stewart kept cranking them out under the name 10CC to ever diminishing returns. But what about Godly and Cream? What about the avant garde weirdos? Ooh, well, that's where this stack of records comes from. 
These are all Godly and Cream records. And the first one I showed you guys to answer the question was Godly and Cream's second album, L, which I also found in the cutout bin for $2.99. And I'd seen this album forever in the cutout bins. I had no idea what it was, never really looked at it, until one day I actually flipped over on the back and I said, oh, Godly and Cream. Those are the guys from 10CC. Okay, I'll get this. And it also had um, a certain object on the back, which was very, very eye-catching to an adolescent dude. So I got the record, and this had all of the missing ingredients from those latter-day 10cc records. This is some weird, superbly produced, incredibly played, really sort of qualifies as avant-garde, eccentric rock and roll. Not even rock and roll. I mean, there's nothing really normal about any of this stuff. No normal lyrics, no normal instrumentation, quite unusual cover. That's when I said, Godly and Cream, sign me up. I'm on board for anything you guys do. Godly and Cream are well worth taking a deep dive into. Even, even, their much maligned triple album box set consequences. Even this one. It's a triple album so it's, this is actually the band, that, this is the record that broke up 10CC because they wanted to go off, Godly and Cream wanted to go off and do this massive experimental project and, you know, irreparable damage to the band structure resulted. So Goldman and Stewart kept the name 10CC and ran it into the dirt very quickly. Godly and Cream spent about, um, I don't know the exact figures, but let's just say... 17,000 hours of studio time and many millions of dollars making a triple album box set that is two-thirds bullshit. Two-thirds jive-ass turkey. The funny thing is, the one album is amazing. The first album of the, the three-album box set is no fool and incredible. <clears throat> this record got such short shrift when it came out and was so completely ignored and reviled that I never bothered listening to it until, you know, as usual, I bought a record collection and this was in it. And I was like, well, it is godly and cream. Might as well play it. And I swear to God, kids, side one and side two blew me away. Mostly instrumental. Oh, it's just great. It is so great. And then um, sides three four, five, and six. Half-baked radio play with a couple of songs interspersed. And only one of those songs is really, really, truly good. So, okay, critics kind of sort of be damned because sides one and two of this are absolute genius. The rest of it, critics were right. Sorry, Godly. Sorry, Cream. Y'all laid an egg with two-thirds of this one. Pear from Sweden says he used to have consequences in his collection, sold it 20 years ago. Pear, I have a question. From what I've read, apparently one of the deal breakers for consequences when it came out was that it was incredibly expensive. It had a huge, like, high list price. Like, at the time, I, I don't know what it was. It was like $19.00 when your average record costs less than half of that. Was that your experience in Sweden? Did you buy this new? And if you did, was it indeed incredibly expensive? That's one of the reasons why the album tanked, because nobody wanted to lay out that kind of money for a triple album, you know? Just curious if you can uh, offer some insight on that. But basically, the rest of Godly and Cream's output, all of them, great. Great. Love them. Love them, love them, love them, love them. In a, in a musical fist fight, in a musical battle, ro uh, battle royal, it is plain to see who the winners were. Nice try, Goulbin and Stewart. Nice try. They kept cranking them out up until the early 80s. Nice try, you know, with the 
you know, kind of sort of weird album cover, but man. And the thing is, even they've admitted that those Latter-day albums were pretty weak. They're, they're actually very honest and straightforward and blunt about it. They all, they all, they agree, Graham Goldman especially agrees that after Bloody Tourists, and especially after a really catastrophic car accident that Eric Stewart suffered, 10CC was just never the same. They just, like, they lacked direction, they lacked a voice in the marketplace, the wind was just knocked right out of their sails. So, you know, it wasn't a matter of fault necessarily, more a matter of, haha, are you ready? Consequences and circumstances. And even Godly and Cream are out of steam after a while. They don't even work together anymore. And uh, basically, from what I've read and understand, the only two members of 10CC who even talk to each other anymore are Gouldman and Godly. So... That's how it ends sometimes, kids. And the last postscript that I want to add to my ranting and raving and rumination about 10CC is that the four members of 10CC did a lot of work together prior to the official formation of the band as anonymous studio musicians. They worked for Castle and its Cats, who were known for putting together fake bubblegum bands in the 60s, like the Lemon Pipers, the Ohio Express, um, Crazy Elephant, a whole bunch of them. And they would just grind out these anonymous, generic, bubblegum, and attempted hit singles. Well, the four members of 10CC all worked for that outfit, and they, they to their own admission, cranked out more songs, and they can even possibly remember, let alone know anything about. Now, you guys know I love cheesy, sleazy exploitation records. I love cynical cash-ins. I love artless attempts at making money with music. I, I love that stuff. It's hilarious. I think it's fascinating. So you can, you can imagine my joy when I came across this little gem of a jam. Fur... That's F-U-R-R. -R. Looks like four extremely low-budget Peter Chris's in a really terrible Destroyer-esque kind of pose. Man, this is... I mean, I, I, I saw this and fell in love with it immediately. It was so bad. And, uh, you know, the records is generic and nondescript as you could possibly hope for, but, you know, the more I listened to it, the more I started to hear some familiar sounds. Some sounds I loved, some instrumentation that I kind of recognized. And so I started to dig real deep into it. And sure enough, not the whole album, but I think about four or five tracks on this, are from the Proto 10CC. You've got Godly and Cream for sure, probably Eric Stewart, maybe Graham Goldman, but they're on several of these songs. And the more you listen to the classic 10CC and the Godly and Cream stuff, the more you, you recognize their style and their, their, their style, their writing, their playing. You could have knocked me over with a, with a feather when I realized that those guys are on this god-awful attempt at cashing in on Kiss from 1977. Fur actually features a lot of 10cc on it. And he could have knocked me over twice with that same feather when I was perusing another one of my very favorite artless cash-in records, this generic, aggressive sound of punk rock album featuring a generic punk rocker on the front. And if you like this album, you'll love these, you know, Italian soundtracks and Montavani and Charlie Chaplin. And, you know, if you thought punk rock was great, way to hear our Charlie Chaplin rip off. So it's kind of the same deal. It's got four or five very badly rendered punk rock songs, but by cracky, the rest of the album, 
if you listen very carefully, sure enough, it's 10 cc before they were 10 cc. So aficionados of this type of stuff already love this album. But now if, if there are any 10 cc fans out of there out there, you got to add this to your list because they're on it. Not the whole thing, but I think about four of these tracks are the Proto 10 cc. And it really makes me wonder what else, what other wonderful truck stop, thrift shop, dime store cash in records there are out there featuring these guys. I'll mention too that they did a lot of session work before they were 10 CC, including for guys like Neil Sadaka. They play on this entire album and get full credit. That's pre 10 CC. And of course, before they were 10 CC, they made the transition from sleazy, cheesy exploitation to 10 CC in a group called Hot Legs. And this stuff is definitely far more handbag and fur than it is 10 cc it's very nondescript it's pretty generic but if you're obsesso like me you gotta have it you gotta hear it you gotta have the european repress and you of course gotta have the original u.s press because we're nutty that way we're just a bunch of whack balls here and that my friends is this week's episode of Tent Talks Tunes, in which I went into morbid detail about my love and obsession for 10cc. And don't worry, it could have been a lot worse. It could have been much worse. I could have gone into a lot more detail. But like King Diamond, I believe in merciful fate. So if any, but if any of you guys want to hear a lot more about 10cc, if you'd like to enter into, me into a meaningful dialogue about 10cc, or maybe you want to purchase some 10cc vinyl from me, because I do have some in my inventory, hit me up on the messenger. Talk to me. We can go on about 10cc for as long as you want, and quite possibly longer. So thanks guys for tuning in and uh, making it all the way through. I do appreciate it. It is my full expectation to be back in one 167 hours. So until we meet again, this is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State.